everybody. This is the progress report for this uh, second Wednesday in December of the dreadful year 2020, which can't end soon enough. We all agree on that. And this time on the progress report, we're doing something a little different than we've ever done. We've done, you know, 11 years of almost entirely live shows, almost and always with a guest. I hope people have enjoyed the guests we've had over the many years. We tried a couple of weeks ago to do it uh, entirely remote. And uh, we did a couple of shows that way. And uh, kind of the downside on that is that we can't take your calls, which we like to hear from you. So today we have a, uh, what they call in the school education system now, the hybrid system. I'm in downtown Manchester at the end, the Manchester Public TV studio by myself, all alone. But I have with me on Skype, my dear friend and great co-host, uh, Mike Farley, and my also great friend and feisty, irrepressible, and always uh, passionate, uh, Deborah Arnie Arneson. Hey, guys. Say hi. Good to be here with you, Bob. You made it happen. <laughs> okay. So we're, uh, we're off and running, folks. Uh, uh, Mike, uh, you, just, you just knocked my socks off by telling me some news before we were trying to check in. Just, just getting on the show, can, can you share that? And uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say it if it's not uh, something real, but uh, what you had was... Just unbelievable. No, it's in the news. It's in the news. Go on, tell It's in the news. It, it's, uh, I just heard a report. It was uh, a breaking news on Channel 9 that um, uh, I, I guess Speaker-elect Dick Hinch um, has passed away. Um, there were no real um, details provided, um, but we do know that there's been some, some interesting behavior on the part of the Republican caucus with regard to protecting themselves uh, from COVID. So, I mean, the mind speculates a little bit at this point. So let me let me read you the news from WMUR, okay? Yes, this please, is literally please. Breaking Thank you, Ernie. Thank you, Ernie. Hinch, was, Hinch was just elected speaker last week as he presided over an outdoor session of the House on the University of New Hampshire campus. He had represented Merrimack for seven terms as a pro-business Republican, served as majority minority leader before being nominated by his party for the speakership last month. The news has sent shockwaves through New Hampshire politics. In a statement from the office of the Speaker of the House, officials asked for the highest level of privacy and respect as they deal with this unexpected tragedy. There are no t details yet to share at this time. Uh, following the announcement, Chris New directed all flags to go at half past. So the question is, uh, what did he die of? Was it a heart attack? Was it COVID? We don't know. But I just want to remind everyone that he was recently at the McIntyre ski area for the GOP caucus and was seen uh, fraternizing with other Republicans not wearing a mask. A number of those Republicans have basically have been reported to have COVID. And now, uh, literally within you know days of the big uh, opening event, uh, for, for opening day, he is now no longer with us. So uh, it is a tragedy. And I just want everyone to know whether he had COVID or not, he is the perfect target for this. He's overweight. He's older. He's been around people who have it. And unfortunately, that is problematic. Well, well Arnie, 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 I think Arnie, I you're think getting, you're getting a, a, auto, a, little, a little head over, head your, over skis your skis on this. On this. It's hard, it's for, hard me for me to believe, believe that this could this be a result, be a result of, COVID. of COVID this instantly. This instantly, instantly you, know? you know, COVID, COVID usually, usually uh, requires a... You know, is a... you have not studied COVID. You are absolutely wrong on this, Bob. You're Am absolutely I? wrong. Okay. People, people, people can go asymptomatic, Bob, for for a week or more, and then be rushed to the emergency room, crashing with no oxygen saturation, and it can be too late. People crash very, very quickly. Not all of them. It's not common, but it happens. And it could be a clock. Well, I did not know that. You're telling me things that I'm interested, that I'm interested to know. To I did know. not I did know that. Know that. No, it, it could be a clot. It could have been, I mean, there are, it, it creates other conditions that, in fact, could cause death. So you might be asymptomatic, but you might be exhibiting other conditions that nobody can see or know, and then you can die. So I, I'm not suggesting this is what happened, but what I am saying it's, is it's, is that in some ways he's got both the profile for someone who could be easily uh, affected by COVID. He's also been in an environment around a lot of maskless Republicans who basically think this is a liberty issue, not only for them to die, but for them to cause other members to die and possibly to bring it home to their communities. Because what we're seeing is every time Republicans get together, it's a super spreader event. Wow. Wow. I'm just I'm stunned. Just stunned. I'm, just I'm just absolutely stunned by stunned this. By it. Um, it, it, really, it really shakes the foundations of things, you know? I mean, uh, uh, what now? What now? 
Well, you know, you think uh, New Hampshire, unlike many states, we do not have a lieutenant governor. If the governor cannot serve because of death or disability, the next, uh, the next one up is the, the uh, president of the Senate. And we've had that happen. That, that has happened. Yeah. And then after that yeah. would be the Speaker yeah. of the House. So he yeah. was third in his line of succession to the executive leadership of our state. And not to mention that he was about to become a, well, I guess, I, I don't know if he's actually been sworn in as Speaker, but as, as Arnie said, he's the Speaker-elect. He was duly elected by their caucus without any uh, untoward, unexpected events and uh, was ready to, to march forward to take over and uh, try and guide the New Hampshire House through this upcoming term, which is going to be fraught if anything ever was. Boy, you know it. Uh, Arnie, uh, it's so wonderful to have you back with us, I can't tell you. You know, we we had a time when I tried without Mike's good help, we couldn't make it work, now we're making it work. Uh, so this is really wonderful. And I know you wanted to talk about the, uh, I hope everybody out there knows Arnie. And by the way, one of the advantages of me being here in the studio instead of on a computer or somewhere else like uh, Mike and Arnie are, we can take your calls. You can still call us with comments and I'll, I'll get them on the air and we'll get our guests to respond or, you know, my co-host, Mike Farley, 640-3091. I came in here specifically for that purpose so I can help our director, with the help of our director, field your call. So call in if we're touching on something that uh, excites you to have a question or a comment. We always, we always welcome participation. But Arnie, uh, you know, I know you were loaded up ready to talk about what happened at the... Uh, at the, with the Republican takeover of the majority in the House and their behavior on organization today. There was a dynamite column in the Concord Monitor today that you directed me to by longtime Representative Kathy Rogers of Concord and great, about uh, the experience. Call. And, uh, and um, you, you, well, you, go ahead, tell, tell us about what your thoughts are on this. I, 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 I want to I wanna put New Hampshire into a, the unique setting that it's in. The only state in America, everyone, of all 50 states that flipped a House and a Senate from Democrat to Republican, frankly flipped it from any direction, was New Hampshire. The yeah. only state. And it turns out there were only two houses that flipped ours in the country. Okay? This is unbelievable. It we is. Have not seen this level of stability, except for us, since 1928. Can you believe it? Wow. They always see about, on average, about 20 houses. You know, either the House or Senate across the 50 states flip during the course, especially of a presidential election. Well, guess what, folks? We were unique. We were the, we were all alone. Not, not in a, a good pro- way. It, not in a good way. And, and actually not in a good way for Chris Sununu. Not in a good Because what's kept Chris Sununu electable was the fact that he was surrounded by Democrats. So he could veto lots of bills, but he didn't have to worry about sort of being dragged half-cocked by a bunch of sort of radical, rabid Republicans. Well, now what's happened is he was reelected. He put his name on, uh, attached to every GOP person running. They got to sort of embrace the Trump party and get elected. And people are thinking that they're electing sort of a mini Chris Sununu. Well, they're not. They're electing a mini Trump. And I think New Hampshire is going to be in a state of shock because we have grown accustomed to either being a purple state, a democratic state, or a reasonable moderate Republican state. Well, you know, fasten your seatbelts, everyone. At the time of a pandemic, when people are dying left and right, when we're spreading this disease, where no one can enforce a mask mandate, especially in libertarian New Hampshire, and an economy that's in free fall, look what you just elected. This is gonna be the result of the kind of choices you think you made. You thought you were electing a sort of a variation on Chris Sununu. Well, let me tell you right now, you elected people that were more like free staters, libertarians, or Donald Trump. They have didn't, no respect for the institution, and you will see failure on a glorious level. Didn't we see wow. something very wow. similar to this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I, a good uh, rant, Ernie. And that's an amazing I, I, rant, and I think it's as always reasonable. I'm afraid for us, because we don't, we, we don't even know what it's like because it's been so different. Think about it, we had Lynch, we had Shaheen, we had Hassan. Frankly, we had Sununu surrounded by Democrats. And but Arnie, remember Arnie, this. Arnie we, we, we went through Bill O'Brien, and, and I can still reca- re- 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 recall Governor Benson. I mean, we've we've been through these weirdo phases before. But not, all right, so let's, let's go back to Governor Benson. What did Governor Benson do? 
he invited the free staters to New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. right? And what was so interesting was he was so out of whack with Governor Benson that Republicans and Democrats wanted him out. Let's remember that. It was a kumbaya. Governor Lynch was the best moderate Republican the Republican Party could ever find, and he had to run as a Democrat. <laughs> I, mean, let's be honest. I agree with that. <laughs> You know, uh, as you well know, and I guess my viewers here will know too, I did not stand for re-election this time, and I was feeling very, very upset about it. Now I'm a little less upset than I was, because number one, we don't have the majority. We're 13 votes shy of a majority. And as you point out, this is a, this is a unique event around the country, because we had both the House and the Senate flip, which is, I guess, I think you said, and I'm sure you're right, this is the only state in the country where this happened. When we elected the federal, at the federal level, all the Democrats that were on the ticket, they were all incumbents, but we elected them all. So uh, I guess my question is, why did this happen to us, and where do we have to go to fix it, and who should we look to to be accountable for this, this disaster at the state level for, from the point of view of the Democrats? So, Mike, here's what I think. I think that you heard from Republicans I mean, from Democrats, Gene Shaheen and the two members of Congress, the words that they use consistently was bipartisan. Yeah. They talked about bipartisan leadership. They talked about the kumbaya. Republicans didn't say that. Okay, Chris Sununu never talked about bipartisan. But in a way, Shaheen and Pappas and, and Annie kind of implied that they were being bipartisan. And who were they being bipartisan with? But in fact, Chris Sununu. You remember when they brought all those PPEs from China, and you know Dean Kamen was there with a with a big you know at the uh, with a big airplane. Yeah, you know, right, there. right there at Manchester it's, Airport. Yeah. Right, right. It was like it was like it was like kumbaya. You didn't know which was the Republican and the Democrat. All you knew is they were bringing gifts for God. Okay. So you had that happening at the top of the ticket, and then Shaheen never used any of her political capital to help Democrats. Never. Yeah. Never. She didn't lift one finger. And let me blame someone else. That most beloved governor, John Lynch. John Lynch came out of the closet, <laughs> Joe Biden. Then he disappeared. <laughs> well, you know what? John Lynch could have lifted a finger for Democrats. Why? Because this is the most important election year in a decade. Yeah. This the is the year. Ten year the 10 year election, redistricting, reapportionment. Redistricting. Will we be gerrymandered again? Yes, ago. we will. Right. right. And, and more importantly, but if you had had Shaheen and Lynch coming out and saying, you need to elect the Democrats to the House and the Senate for this reason, if they had used any of their political capital, guess what? The Democrats would have maintained control. But they didn't lift a finger. They echoed that bipartisan crap, which yeah. wasn't even true in the, in the in the Senate or in the House. I mean, it was, it's a lie, let's yeah. be honest here. And then on top of that, Chris Sununu used his affability and his charm and the fact that we've been behaving ba uh, badly, but it's because we've been behaving well that he got covered. And and they actually really worked hard to get those folks elected, and they got elected. They knocked on doors. They didn't just do lit drops. They knocked on doors, and then they stepped back and they talked to people. We were told we couldn't do that. We were told you could only drop literature, but you couldn't talk to people yeah. because of COVID. But that's not true. Yeah. You could have knocked on the door. You could have waited for someone to come out, had your mask on, been social distance, and said, can we talk? But we were told not to do that. Yeah. Well, guess what? I, I, I agree. I think that was a significant factor. Arnie, what you've been saying makes me want to tell a story, which I'm sure I must have told on this program before, but if not recently. My first effort at winning elective office was to run for Senate 
from uh, District 16, which includes three wards in Manchester and four towns in uh, you know, Bow, Candia, Dunbarton, and Hooksett in 2006. And at the time, my opponent was Ted Gatzis. We all know Ted. He's been the mayor of Manchester for several terms. He's currently an executive counselor, recently got reelected. In 2006, he was actually the Senate president. And I raised a lot of money, and I did everything they told me to do to, to, to take on Ted Gatzis. And the one thing that I never got from any help from was Governor John Lynch. He never would appear with me. He wouldn't have his picture taken with me. And eventually I found out that the reason was that he'd made a deal with Ted Gatzis, that he would not help Ted Gatzis' opponent, and, and, uh, and uh, Ted Gatzis would not help his opponent. So I, I, I was the victim of that deal between Ted Gatzis and John, uh, and John Lynch. And in the final result, out of almost 17,000 votes cast, I lost by 314 votes, having carried all three wards in Manchester, having carried oh Bo, God. but not Hooksett or Candia or Dunbarton. And so that was the end of my attempt to be a, a state senator. And all along the way, I was saying to the uh, Democratic people, is the governor going to is the governor going to support the entire Democratic ticket? They never said yes to that, and I was one that they chose not to support. And I know, I know, because I campaigned hard. Those 300 votes were in John Lynch's pocket. All he, would, all he had to do was say, I want you to elect Bob Backus to support me as a fellow Democrat. That's all he had to do. He never did it. But, but let me just say something, Bob. The immorality of Shaheen, Shaheen and Lynch, both having been governors, okay? So they understand what, what, what was going on. They also understand how important the census year is that this is the most important year because the damage will be done for a decade. And if there was a year for them to use some of their political capital, this was the year. And when you look at the pandemic and when you look at, at the economy, they had three reasons to really come out and help. Come out and help because people really do value them. Look at Gigi. She won easily. There was never going to be a question about whether she was going to win. John Lynch could have been elected for 12 terms. He could have won easily. So if they had come out and said anything to support some people in the Senate and the House, it would have really changed people's voting. Because think about it. How could people have voted for Biden, for Shaheen, or Custer, or Pappas, and then vote Republican? Yeah. How is that possible? Well, it's because they didn't really understand the consequences. Shaheen and Lynch could have explained the consequences in a much more effective manner, and they could have been heard. Yeah, so the yeah. looming question, Arnie, is is why? I, I'm, and I'm, and I, I, I'm not actually looking to, for speculation. I, we could do that. That would be fun. But, um, you know, you, you've got your fingers on the pulse. What, uh, what have you heard? What was the reasoning? Were they in that much jeopardy that they had to put all their eggs into their own baskets? Because it didn't look like their opponents were that tough. No. Um, right. We're, we're now running. Uh, Democrats don't run as Democrats in New Hampshire at the top of the ticket. They run as independent contractors. It's the Shaheen party. It's the Hassan party. It's the Pappas party. It's the it's Lynch the party. It's the Lynch party, exactly. So if that's the case, then they don't feel a need to sort of address what the rest of us are going to need, which is some support. Remember, we have 400 legislators. You can't pick them out of a lineup. Nobody knows who they are. This was the year of the pandemic. No, you know that, Bob. I this do. Was the year of the I do. I know. This was the year of the pandemic. So, so many of us were cloistered at home. We were we were not sort of focusing on what was happening, other whether whether we were going to survive or get a paycheck. I mean, that was really what we were obsessing about. But the people that really could have punched out turned out to be the people that didn't show up. And I was also told by a number of House members that they were not given lists in order to be able to walk the street. They were forbidden to do that. Right. That came from leadership. Well, so that, if you're that goes, in those lists, yeah. then guess what? You can't even do the right thing because you're being told that's not how you behave. Well, you know, you're just reinforcing the point you already made, which is one I've heard others make, that, you know, the Democrats kind of shot themselves in the foot by shooing door-to-door uh, -door campaigning, which is the most effective form of campaigning, it's certainly at the House level, I think also at the State Senate level. You know, when you get up to the higher level races, it's not that effective because there's many more doors that are going to contain voters you can't get to. But you know, at this level, the door-to-door -door campaigning, 
and the Republicans didn't let the, the, the pandemic stop them. They went right ahead. They went right ahead. Now, the other thing that I'm hearing a lot about, and I'd like you to weigh in on this, Arnie and Mike, too, if you want to, is a feeling that the, that the party, the party, uh, you know, under the leadership of Chairmanship Buckley, spent too much of their time, effort, and, I guess, money on supporting the federal candidates and kind of ignored the state races. Do you buy that one? Always. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean let, let, I, I'm, I'm going to say something that's going to sound terrific, but in a way, I don't know whether we're going to maintain the presidential primary during the next, in 2024. I know Iowa's going to lose the caucus, so let's just start with that as a, as a blank slate. Really? Yeah, Iowa's going to lose the caucus? That's a done deal? Yeah. It's a, well, Iowa's a mess. Iowa, trust me. Yeah, I mean, they yeah. couldn't do it. They, 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 they couldn't even do their general election. Oh, that's let right. Off. Yeah, there, right, was so a, there was a whole... Meltdown well, over there in Iowa. They they couldn't they couldn't get the results. Well, and not only that, they haven't still figured out what happened. Okay, this is months later, and they still haven't figured out what happened. Yeah. And, I, and 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 a caucus is really it just doesn't make sense. It's not even democratic. Let's be honest. It's, yeah. it's a real problem. So they've lost it. And if Iowa has lost the caucus, there's the possibility that they may want to say, you know what? Let's start with a blank slate. And a blank slate, because Iowa and New Hampshire have always gone together, we sort of locked our arms and gone together. So if Iowa goes, and maybe, guess what, maybe New Hampshire goes as well. Wouldn't and, that be something? We have well, Bill Gardner running for yet another term, his 18th or 19th, when the word was out last time that it was going to be his last effort, his last campaign to be Secretary of State. And then it turns out it wasn't his last. He ran again and got elected again, this time with far more support from Democrats than he ever had from Republicans. Although Bill claims to be a nominal Democrat from Manchester, by the way, and uh, and uh, wouldn't it be something if his legacy as the great defender of the New Hampshire primary crashed? Uh, well, well, that would be a sad day, I think, Bob. I don't think we want to wish that on. No, him. I don't think so. What? That's one thing that does breach the go, bridge the partisan divide in New Hampshire. Our support well, for the being first. All right. So, so I'm going to say something that you're going to get angry at me about. And I think the problem with having the first the nation primary is that they've never cared about state politics. You see, what happens at the state level is expendable because everybody is always focused on what's going to happen inside the beltway. And that is whether you're getting, you know, a, a member into the U.S. Senate or a member of the House. I mean, at one point in time, they were talking about Maggie Hassan being a possible VP pick. Think about that. Yeah. Her name, Mike. Yeah, and it's absolutely true. So everything is always focused on how you sort of genuflect for presidential politics and how you sort of support what happens at the federal level. Well, if that's where your focus is, then what happens in Concord has no meaning. That's one of the reasons why I hate to say this. I obviously was a supporter of Andrew Walensky. Not that I think that the guy that did get the nomination wasn't a nice guy, but he was kind of like the wallpaper, you know? And, and, and this was not an election where you didn't want a fighter. It wasn't that probably Chris Sununu wasn't going to win re-election, but if you didn't have someone who could really punch out and fight and have done a lot of grassroots work even before he ran for governor, you weren't going to be able to protect members of the House and Senate. And so, but they, they chose someone that wasn't going to upset the apple cart. Well, you know what? That's not good politics. That's safe politics, but it's not good politics. But they don't care about what happens at the state level. We are expendable. What happens nationally is what they live for. Well, that's very sad because so much of what happens here is so important. Colin. And, uh, oh, we have an incoming call. Great. Hello, caller. We're happy to welcome you to the Progress Report. Glad you joined us. Have you a question or comment you'd like to share with us and our my co-host Mike and our guest Arnie? Thank you. Go right ahead. Is this, is this Bob I'm talking to? It sure is. Bob, this is Arthur. I met you at a Bonsai restaurant. Oh, I'm yes, there. Arthur. How are you, my friend? I hope you're doing well. Good. Uh, now, listen, I want to ask you a question. Sure. So, the last two days I've been uh, to Bonsai, right? My yeah. bill was $21.80, and the waitress made it $185 tip on each one of them. And I left her a $5 tip on the next one, and she made a $165 tip. What? I was wondering. What? But the owner CC gave me back my money. But I was wondering, can I still press charges on her? You mean when you when you filled out the tip thing, which you do by hand, of course, 
You put in well, five. Yeah, with five dollars as dollar sign, and, and she made one hundred sixty-six dollars. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so within within two days, boss, she got me three hundred fifty bucks. Oh my goodness! Well, it's the Christmas and, season, and but I that. And I went to the police station, and they laughed, and they could see how she changed it out. Well, you know that's a pretty generous tip, but it is Christmas after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but listen, I'm not that wealthy. I'm not Donald Trump. <laughs> I know. That's a heck of a story. I've heard about that happening in other places, that that's, that that's a place where this is a real danger. And so, uh, but, you know, you, you, you get caught. This, this, whoever did this to you certainly got caught. I hope the woman, is, you, you know, I mean, giving it back right, doesn't... But you know, you, know, you know the funny thing is, Bob, what upset me the most yeah. is that CCTV gave me back my money, right? Yeah. And she screwed me on. But yeah. did not fire the employee. What? Yeah. She's got to fire. Well, I don't know. I suppose she doesn't have to. Oh my gosh, that's a, that, that's a heck of a story, Arthur. And, I, and by the way, I didn't know bond size was even open. Are they having indoor seating in there now? Yeah. Well, well, that that was the thing. But she was closed for four months, and she had to pay her rent, so she screwed me. Oh, I see. Oh God. That's, I but see. That's gonna be Sorry, that's a story. So that's that's a So that's a real COVID now, story right there. Yeah, it is. Right. So as an attorney, so I went to the police station. They got it for forgery and grand larceny over two fifty. Yeah. Serious. Now even though TC gave me back my money, will she still get arrested? If you want to press charges, she could be arrested. Yes. Yes, and I definitely want to press charges. Well, and I think you know. I already did. I brought it to the police station. That may be a mitigating factor when it comes to the disposition of the case after she's found guilty, but it won't be, it won't be a defense to her guilt. Okay, because when I brought it to the police station, there was a, a woman uh, that was a police officer who was more upset because she was a bartender. Yeah, yeah. And she said, I can't believe that she did this to you around the holiday. Right, right. Well, that's a heck of a story, Arthur. Well, I, ho I hope to see you again soon, and thanks for calling. <laughs> All right, Bob. Have okay. a good day. Take care. <laughs> well. Holy cow, that, that's, that, you know what, that really is a COVID story, Bob, you know? Yeah. Actually, it's a, it, it, it screams COVID relief package. Yes. Yeah, it did, didn't it? We, we should look at that side of it. I yeah, was just listening to, uh, you know, what is, what, what is the NPR show on the marketplace or whatever it is. And, there's, you know, there's a million people who are behind on their mortgages or, or subject to eviction for not being able to make rent. A million people. And this all depends on the Congress coming through with more COVID, you know, stimulus or economic relief, really, is which, what it should be called. And by the way, Arnie, I, I heard a very distressing thing today about Gene Shaheen, who's one of my favorite public officials. I think Gene Shaheen's an awesome senator. But I hear, I heard that according to Robert Reich, the former Secretary of Labor, that Gene Shaheen is one of four Senate Democrats who was prepared to abandon the opposition to, you know, in, immunizing corporations from liability for. You mean for, that's uh, the quote unquote safe harbor? That's safe harbor. Safe yeah. Harbor. Had you heard that? That she she's prepared to abandon the Democratic position that we don't immunize corporations from liability for you know negligence or wrongdoing just because it's tough times. I mean, Aaron, I, I was I absolutely been? shocked where, by that. Where have I been? What'd you say, Mike? <laughs> I mean, it, this, this is exposing some truths. I mean, but remember, this is the woman that, you know, the death penalty. You know, oh, yeah. Penalty. Oh, yeah, so that's I, very tough to swallow. And, and, and the re I, I wonder what she thinks about what Bill Barr is doing with the federal prisoners, that they now want to kill them. How do they want to kill them? They want to shoot them? They want to drug them? They want to yeah. gas them? Yeah. I, I, I want to I call Gene Shaheen like, you like this? Which one do you like, Gene? Yeah. Which one? Since you since you vetoed the repeal of the death penalty, I mean, thank God we repealed it now. But yeah. back then, when you repealed it, I mean, maybe we're lucky. Maybe we should have had like four or five options, and then she's going to pick the one she liked. Yeah. But, but I was looking at, I mean, we have literally, the federal government has had the death penalty on hiatus for 17 years. For 17 years, yeah. we have not done anyone on, on death row in the federal penitentiaries. Now Bill Barr and Donald Trump on their way out want to make sure they off as many people as possible yeah. and do it in a terrific way. Yeah, and this mean, is the pro-life crowd, right? Yes. Oh, my God. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable. You know, it, it's very disappointing to me, Bob. I feel like I, I feel like my senator is Joe Manchin instead of um, the 
kind of senator that I thought I was voting for. Imagine that. Pretty conservative guy, yes. Joe Manchin, West Virginia, you know? He's not uh, considered yeah. a raving, a raving, He's not a Democrat the way a I liberal it. like uh, you are, Mike. <laughs> well, but let's re let's remember that she's. I mean, these are people that are clearly abusing the health and safety of their workers, of their customers. They are literally exposing them with knowledge. Yeah, and we just, we're supposed to knowledge. immunize them from any liability when the regulatory system is being torn down. So there's no no way to hold these, these corporations accountable if you can't do it in court because they, they're violating, you know, common law principles of, the, you know, acting reasonably. And, uh, or worse, or worse. So, so, wait a minute, so let's, let's do a let's make a deal, Jeannie. Are you supporting Medicare for all? Yeah. I mean, if you're going, if you're going to protect the companies so that they can expose you to death and permanent illness, Mm. Then at least make sure that if you lose your job, you don't lose your health care. Yeah. Let's make sure. I mean, so I mean, let's. I mean, I hate to say this. If you're going to do this for corporations, what are you going to do to protect me from the cost of getting very sick or possibly dying? Yeah. And I'm, one of the ways you can take care of me is making sure that I don't have affordable health care, that I have universal health care, and I know I can go to a doctor when I'm sick, no matter whether I'm employed or whether I have a paycheck. Right. Right. You know, Jenny, I, I think I think you're asking that question rhetorically. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Arnie, Arnie, you know I got such uh, admiration for your insights, but this may be a this may be a stretch. Where do where do we where do we think we go with Dick Hinch? Apparently, no longer with us. I mean, it's, oh, great uh, question. my best wishes to to Dick's family and all. I mean, I don't wish anybody to have this untimely demise, obviously. But where do we go from here? You got any thoughts I, on that? No, I have. Uh, trust me, they're in turmoil. They're in turmoil right well, now. Well, I think the deputy speaker that he picked was Sherm Packard. Right, right. And uh, he's got a lot of experience, and is is as you know, within that crowd, he's reasonable. I mean, you know, he's not he's not one of the total crazies. And like, does Ken Weiler want it? He's the chair of finance. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. Is there anybody? Is there anybody in that caucus? Who could um, control them? Uh, they're they're pretty wild and wooly these days. Well, they are, and you know it was a kind of interesting to me that Dick Hinch got this without a big upset, you know, protest vote like happened with uh, Bill O'Brien when he tried to come back and was ousted by Sherm Packard with the help of the Dem not Sherm Packard, Sean Jasper, with the help of the Democrats. Uh, what two terms ago, three terms ago, whatever it was, and right. uh, you know, but uh, I guess they they're going to have to have another caucus, aren't they? They go back yeah, to McIntyre and do the same thing all over again. <laughs> oh boy! Well, they're actually they're actually talking about that. But let me just remind everyone that that the kind of behaviors that are going to be embraced by this New Hampshire legislature is so problematic because not only are is it problematic for them, but there are lots of members of the Democratic side that have lots of very fragile health conditions. Yeah, yeah. And and and. and the New Hampshire House, everyone, remember, it's, it's the same body that's been, you know, been used since you know, the dawn of man, okay? It's the only continuous use legislative office, bill, legislative building in the country. And they sit like they're in a movie theater. I mean, so it's not like they have a desk. They sit right next to each right. other. Right. And, and, and this building is referred to as a sick building because it doesn't have good air circulation. That's it the, is divine. That's, that's actually the LOB that's referred to as a sick building. The state house right. has actually pretty good ventilation, but no social distancing. You're absolutely right about that. You can't do it. No, no, but, 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 the, but my understanding is the state house's ventilation is air conditioning. No, they've that's got good ventilation in the state house. The LOB has ventilation only when the air conditioning's running, which you're not oh, going to do, you know, uh, in the next few uh, months. Uh, so what, what are we doing? I mean, look what we're doing. We're creating a toxic situation with a bunch of people who refuse to wear masks. And then, of course, you're going to invite the public in. And knowing the kind of pieces of legislation that are going to be introduced, yeah. the public that's going to be coming in is going to look a lot like the maskless people that are sitting uh, at yeah. the table. And, and so it's going to be, it really is going to be a constant, constant barrage of super spreading events as things get more and more frightening. And frankly, I, I want to apologize to every doctor, every nurse, every EMT, every every hospital worker in this state because of what we're going to do to them. Because it's about them that I actually start to care about. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh, my goodness. You know, and uh, despite the pleas of the... Uh, 
our, our former majority leader, Doug Lay, uh, now succeeded by my good friend and hero, Rennie Cushing, despite those pleas, there's been about 800 LSRs, legislative service requests, filed by legislators who want to introduce bills. And in New yeah. Hampshire, as I think my viewers probably know, our viewers, I should say, probably know, we have a proud tradition of every bill, crazy as some of them are, gets a hearing and gets a House vote on the House floor. How are we going to do that? How can we do that? The LOB is even worse shape than the State House. And the State House is verboten because we can't social distance anyway. So uh, how are we going to process 800 bills in this, in this first session of this term that's about to start on January 6th? Oh, my goodness. Well, it, I mean, there, there are so many things happening. And, and I think the most important thing right now is we need another COVID relief package. They have to develop another COVID relief package. They have to. And it they, has they to have. include support for st states and towns. We the can't just leave that out of it. The numbers are in the wrong direction, though. The, 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 uh, we're bidding against ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're, we, we, the, the Speaker of the House was holding out for a lot higher number than, than um, what, what's on the table now. And Mnuchin just came in and chiseled another... Uh, I think five hundred million off of it. No, no, no. It, it's worse than that. I just heard that Donald Trump will not sign a bill that includes an additional three hundred dollars for those that are unemployed. He will not sign a bill that has an additional three hundred dollars for people that are receiving unemployment checks. They can have their unemployment check extended, but they can't get the additional three hundred dollars. And you know what's so tragic about this? And I think this is really important. Most people don't know until they collect unemployment for the first time how tiny that check is, how tiny it is. Yeah. Uh, especially you know, in New Hampshire. Especially and these are the people that are living paycheck terrible. to paycheck, you know? Right, right. I mean, I, you I, could, you I could cut the income for the hedge fund manager and the, you know, the CEOs and they wouldn't even, you know, what the heck, they maybe take one less trip to Europe this year or wherever, you know? <laughs> but, but, but if you go to Massachusetts, the, the, I believe the unemployment, the maximum unemployment in Massachusetts is twice what it is in New Hampshire. Yeah. Twice. Yeah. Twice. Really, so I didn't know that. Hear, when, when people hear about the extra 300 or 400, or they think, oh my God, these people are like fat on the hog. No, they're not. They're starting with a check that you need a microscope to see. So, you know, they, they couldn't pay any bills. A lot of them by now are probably going to have to go on COBRA because they've only been covered by their, their health insurance for a certain period of time. And COBRA will wipe out every single dime. Oh, yeah. they're unemployed. Oh, uh, if you can afford the, the policy. Right. You right. know, on, on an unemployment check, if you've got a family, you know, it's, especially a family now that has to stay home because the kids aren't in school, this is tough. This is yeah. tough times. Well, and so um, NPR just, uh, and New Hampshire Public Radio just released a report that I believe Dartmouth Hitchcock and maybe, I don't know who else, but they, they got together and they were looking at what's happening in our nursing homes. Because our nursing homes are really devastated, okay? They, they, they can't control the COVID there. That's where most deaths are. And I believe we have the highest number of deaths in nursing homes of any state in the nation. So we know that it's a problem. So guess what they found out, Bob? You're going to love this. They found out that most people that work in nursing homes work two jobs. <gasps> really? Shop, shop. Well, it's not surprising. They don't get paid squat. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's the joke. They're shocked that they have to work two jobs. But here's the kicker. If you are working in a nursing home and you need additional income, guess what you do? Since you have nursing home or nursing skills, you go to another nursing home or you go to a hospital. or you go, So you, go, you stay within the same setting, but you go somewhere else to get the paycheck. But what does that mean? That means you're taking your COVID potential and you're spreading it right. around. Just go home. They yeah. go to another place where they could infect someone else. Because they're trying to figure out what's happening at these nursing homes and how do we control it. And all of a sudden they're realizing that the staff are like fairy dust. They're spreading it around everywhere because they need to work more than one job to get an adequate paycheck to pay the bills. Jeez. This is what happens when you don't compensate people. This yeah. is another example of the pandemic. Yeah, it sure is. Oh my so goodness. I thought oh my maybe God. I would turn to another subject to get your take on this, uh, folks. Uh, my son lives in London, so I 
pay pretty much attention to what happened in the UK, and now everybody is, because starting yesterday, they began providing, you know, target populations, the elderly and others, with the first ever use of the, the, the vaccine. And it's, you know, big news all over the world. You've all seen it. Anybody who's watching the show has seen it. And I'm thinking about that, and I'm looking at our country, and we're trying to make a deal with uh, Walgreens and CVS to help us distribute these drugs. <laughs> well, what about that? How about that? How about this National Health Service? National Health Service handles it with no problems about, you know, I mean, it just seems like, I mean, we had a call about this last week, didn't we, Mike? I guess you weren't here, Lou was, but I had a call about this. How come Britain's ahead of this? I know it won't make much difference. We'll be there in a week. No, I'm not so sure. We have a country which exemplifies what the, the Republicans like to call socialized medicine, never mind our own VA and other aspects of our medicine. And, uh, and they're, they're moving this out with, a, 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 it seems to me, an extraordinarily amount, a great amount of efficiency and uh, without, any, uh, without any real uh, big issues about the supply line. Hey, 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 Bob, can I jump in and, and, and give you a personal experience regarding Please. our health system? those are the best. This, this week, as, as you know, I'm quarantining right now because um, I had an exposure to COVID through my office. Um, mm -hmm. Fortunately, I don't have any symptoms and I'm fine, uh, but when I went to get tested, um, I showed up in the morning, about uh, about 9 o'clock in the morning, there was a long line. I waited in line, made my way to the front to register, and uh, was told um, that it, it would take about an hour to go wait until I get a text in my car. I got home at 4.50. <laughs> you got home when? 4.50. What time did you get there initially? Nine o'clock. Oh my God! Now, look it. I'm. That's that's really complaint. distressing. And those people were working their tail off, and I didn't realize that had I gotten there at eight, I would have been picked up sooner. The line was long. The demand is high. But my, the point I want to make is, you, you know, I keep hearing, oh my gosh, you're going to have to wait for service if you if you go to um, you, you know to, to a socialized medicine model. But look, let me tell you, you wait here too. <laughs> right. You know, you wait here too. It, 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 it's, it's the way it goes. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I, and, and listen, I, I, I don't mean to complain. I'm very happy that the testing was available. Well, I think you have every right to complain about that. Why should that be? We have the resource in this country to do better. No, yeah, no doubt about it. Always, that, that's what I always heard, but I, I'm not so sure these days. Yeah. But we don't, no, we don't have the resources to do better. Because the resources to do better would have meant that we would have spent a lot of money on public health. Right. And we have starved the public health system because there's no money in public health. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's, for the public health system. Right, well, there's money in specialization. If you're, a, if you're a doctor who's a specialist, there's money. And guess what? If you're a specialist, there's probably a, a great insurance plan to cover your specialty. So, you know, the, the, we, don't, we don't take care of people's health. That's the problem. We don't do health care. We do paper care. We do dollar care. We do all these things, but we actually don't do health care. And I think what you're seeing going on in places around the world, whether it's going to be Canada or, or England or France or whatever, is because they have universal health care, that means everyone knows their doctor. They're everywhere. You know, they're not just in a certain location. They don't, they don't close down their rural hospitals when people in rural areas still need health care. I mean, I wish we treated health care the way we used to treat the post office. You know, yeah, you used to. You, you no, know, we used to exactly. <laughs> you you loved the post office because it was important and it was everywhere. It was everywhere and it meant that it was dependable. Well, we don't do that with healthcare now. And let's talk about CVS and Walgreens. There are going to be places where there isn't a CVS and a Walgreens. Imagine if you were living on a Native American, you know, uh, reservation. There there is there is no place to get a test. There is no place to get a vaccine. You know, there are just islands of, and pockets of places where there isn't going to be access. And one of the reasons it's really interesting, Joe Biden is talking about who he wants to be the head of the Defense Department. And he keeps talking about it. You know how he's talking about it? As getting out the vaccine. They're looking at the arm of public health being the U.S. military. That's how we're going to get the vaccine out. That's how Joe Biden is looking at the military. Donald Trump is looking at CVS and Walgreens, and Joe Biden is looking at using the military to roll out the vaccines because he realizes it's too important and we need to get it everywhere yesterday. Yeah. Unbelievable.
Unbelievable. Unbelievable is right. Oh, my goodness. Well, I don't know how this is all going to work out, but uh, it uh, it doesn't seem to be working as well, and it well, never has under the current president. Well, uh, I, I mean, we, we, two things. We find out that the amount of the Pfizer vaccine that's going out is cut in half. Right. And we also find out that they offered to, to make more available before putting it on the international market, and the United States government passed on the deal. You know, well, you know, you know, in their defense at that time, they didn't know it was going to be the winner of the first one out, so... Maybe it was not the right time to make that. But the theory was warp speed, buy what you can. Yeah, well, so, true. My understanding was they weren't part of the big initial push. They didn't use any federal funds. Oh, they, right, they did it on their own. You're right. That's, this is why. All right, let's go, everyone. This is why yeah. Donald Trump could not claim ownership. And because Donald Trump could not claim ownership of Pfizer being the most successful without the warp speed support from Donald Trump. Donald Trump said, screw you. And what he did... It them, it was us. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, in the end, this is if, if you want to go through, it's kind of like peeling an onion, it always goes back to his ego. You know? And if this isn't going to be good for him, then guess what? We're not going to benefit. Yeah. And that is one of the reasons why we didn't say yes to Pfizer. How awful is that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's... It, yeah, it's, it's, it's got to be something in it for Donald before he's interested at all, which is apparently the reason why we have this ridiculous lawsuit by the Attorney General of Texas suing four other states over their vote results. <laughs> How's that for a lawsuit? No, 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 no. How many states have joined them? It turns out that I believe 14 or 15 AGs have joined the Attorney General, Ken Paxton of Texas. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, it just it just happened. It just I just listed on my Facebook page. Everyone Fourteen Facebook other states have joined. Yes, yes. The attorney oh general and other states have joined Ken Paxton in suing these four states because they, you know, and this is just unbelievable. I, I I'm really going to be curious to see how the Supreme Court responds to this. Tomorrow, supposedly, you're going to get some kind of response from the Supreme Court. But Ken Paxton is no longer alone. All these other AGs have joined him. Well, you're breaking this, news there for me, and I imagine maybe some others. I did not know this. I thought this was a, a Lone Ranger thing on Ken Paxton's part, or Ranger. whatever his name is, because uh, it, it, because he may, maybe wants a pardon from Trump because he's under indictment. Well, I, he's actually under indictment, and he's being investigated by the FBI and the CIA, oh. and he's under indictment for securities yeah. fraud. And I mean, yeah. the, the guy, there's a, there's a story in Texas that if you haven't been indicted, you haven't been invited. I mean, that's kind of the, that's kind of the rule of thumb there. But, um, yeah, there's a, there's a whole list of AGs that have joined Ken Paxton. Oh, well, and look for that. I got a call yeah. here, I think. Hello, yeah. caller. Are you ready to join us on the Progress Report? We're happy to have you with us. And if you want to have a question or comment for me, Arnie, or Mike. Hey, Bob, you need to get on the program. It's now 17 states. 17 states. Yep. I just found it. Thank you, Cole. That's shocking. Yeah, 17 other Republicans. I think that call may have come come from a lawyer. I don't know, but I can't imagine how anybody could think that suit would have any merit. No, nope, it's not exactly clear what Trump meant in promising to intervene in the lawsuit, but now he has the support of 17 other Republican state attorney generals who on Wednesday filed an amicus brief uh, with the flawed arguments. So there you go, everyone. If you're just sort of curious, wow. he was right. Yep. Boy, I am learning um, a lot myself on the progress report tonight from my my esteemed guest and my co-host, they didn't they give me news I didn't even wasn't even aware of coming on the air here. My goodness, well, what and, a and time. Here, as SCOTUS blog has pointed out, Paxton's lawsuit argues that Texas voters were disenfranchised in a national election by lax male voting standards in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Georgia. All right, so... Uh, I'm just, it's, it's, it's somewhat shocking since we assume that election law is the purview of the states, but now we've got states suing other states because they don't like what they're doing. <laughs> well, excuse me, I mean, this is, it's, it's, but it just reinforces the cacophony of insecurity of, and the fragility of this election. That's what's wrong. Well, with it, 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 I would go further than that. I think it, it emphasizes the fragility of our democracy. This delegitimizing this election, which was not yeah. close. Biden won by more than 7 million, or about 7 million more popular votes than Trump got, which I think is a shockingly large sum for, anyway, for Trump. 
But you know, given that and uh, and and the swing states that turned it to uh, to Biden, the, the the voting margins in favor of Biden were very narrow. I mean, they've held up. They were not fraudulent. They're not dishonest. The proper votes were counted. And the proper illegal votes were not counted. But still, very very close. And uh, you know, I guess it just comes back. We got to have an all. The electoral yeah, college is a disaster. I know. I want. I want. I then I want to sue Texas. Why? Because the governor of Texas extended early voting by a week by executive order. Did you know this? Yeah. No. So they, they have early voting in Texas, and trust me, there were Republicans that were pissed off at the Republican governor, Governor Abbott. Governor Abbott, by executive order, because of the pandemic, extended early voting by a week. Well, excuse me, Ken Paxton. Why aren't you suing your governor? All right. You don't like what they're doing in those other states because of what they did by mail? What about what your own governor did by executive order, if not by legislative fiat, everyone? He did it by executive order. He opened up early voting by an extra week. Isn't it interesting? This is like a smorgasbord. Yeah. You know, you take what you like and then you ignore what you don't. Well, now, in his own state, there were issues. And how come he's not noticing? Just pointing it out. Yeah. Oh, I know why. Donald Trump won. You know what That's this says what? to me, though, Arnie and Mike? This says to me that... And I thought it might be otherwise. When I saw that Trump lost the, the national election by a substantial amount of votes, now up to 7 million, and that other, uh, and that other uh, Republicans did well around the country, we did, not, we did not have the repudiation of the Republican Party that many expected. They were not repudiated. You know, the control of the Senate hinges on two long shot Senate races in Georgia, which, you know, would be a miracle if those come in, but may it be so. You know, and with all of that, I would have thought the Republicans looked at the other. Hey, we can do pretty well without Trump. He didn't do well. We did well. Let's let's not uh, be in thrall. I think what you're telling me, Arnie, with this, you know, 17 or whatever states supporting Texas, he still has them. They're in his pocket. The Republican Party is still in thrall to Trump, despite his being a really bad loser, the ultimate sore loser. But you're calling it the wrong party. It's no longer the Republican Party. It is the Trump Party. I'm, that's what I'm saying in different words. And I, but, but, but you can't call them Republicans anymore because that party doesn't exist. Yeah. This well, is I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. They are the Republicans. They're what's left of them. And, and they, they, the Republican brand has to own every ounce of it. The Republican brand has to be trampled underfoot. Well, the they're Republican apparently proud to own it, Mike. They're proud to own it, and they face. think they're doing well with it. I mean, why? Why? why how many? How many he Republican office holders in the Congress have have now admittedly described Joe Biden as the president-elect? Just a handful. Oh, a do half dozen. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that. disgraceful. This election is over. It's been over a long time, and it wasn't close. Well, you know, I mean, they've they've been under the foot of Donald Trump for four years. He has convinced the base that everything he says, whether it's a lie or whether it's a fact, is true. He is questioning the integrity of this election. He basically says he did not lose. And how many was it? 80% of the Republican base supports that concept that he did not lose? That's frightening. That's, that's frightening and hard to explain. I can't believe our country has fallen to that level where, you know, when, when did we ever have such a thing happen? I can't, never, we never did. But it, it, it's, it's more than that, because what I'm really fearing now is Secretary of State and governors around the country are being threatened with violence. Yeah. Now, Donald Trump is not just saying that this election is null and void, I won. He is basically telling people that they should go into the streets and they should take this election back for him. Yeah. And well, we're in the middle of a coup, aren't we? We are. Well, I think that's maybe true. I mean, it's very, very frightening. It just really is frightening. And uh, he obviously is going to be back running for president again in 2024. So, oh but, my goodness. Know, but, 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 Bob, you know, when you scream fire in a crowded theater, you can kill someone. Donald yeah. Trump is doing exactly that on the national stage. He certainly is. He, and, 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 and people will die. And he will try to claim, well, I didn't order the shooting. He did everything but right. order the shooting. And that's what's so scary. Ask the governor of Michigan. Ask some of the attorney generals. Yeah. Ask the secretary of state, where people are literally marching on their houses. Yeah. Um, this the secretary is, of state of Michigan, whose house was surrounded by, you know, protesters with arms. Exactly. I mean, good grief. Exactly. exactly. 
Yeah. So, um, Folks, we're, we're down to about a minute before the show uh, has to close. We've, we've had a real wide-ranging... Uh, yeah, we've had a robust discussion, discussion, as we always do when Arnie's with us. Arnie, thank you so much for joining us. Mike, thank yeah, you so much for helping me make sure this thing could work for us this time. We spent about an hour trying to work it out this afternoon for reasons we can't understand, but it all came together. And thank you so much, Mike, for that. And uh, by the way, best wishes to your wife, Kathy, and her recovery. I understand she's, you know, suffered a broken leg, and I want to want to make sure she's going to be getting heavier, heavier, full attention and care as she recovers from that. Arnie, love you, love you. So glad we had you on when we didn't have you on. It was terrible. I did a monologue. It was. <laughs> Maybe it was that good, I don't know, terrible. but I don't like doing monologues. <laughs> anyway, all right, folks, we'll see what we're going to do next week. Uh, thank you both for contributing very, very nicely and, and, and with wonderful thoughts and comments. Thank you. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week, folks, with another edition of the Progress Report. That's the plan, at least. We'll see you all